Okay, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the SA Southern California section webinar series. Uh, tonight, we have a very exciting topic. Uh, we have a company entitled Light. Uh, they are tier two ADAS software developer. But before we get into the presentation, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items uh, with regards to our section. As you can see from the slide, we have some upcoming events for the month of April. Uh, our first event being the SA Aero Design Challenge. April 8th through the 10th uh, in Van Nuys. Uh, shortly thereafter, we have a Stand 21 Safety Foundation Seminar uh, the week of the Long Beach Grand Prix. Just a point of information, SA members get a discount for the Grand Prix. Also on April 23rd, we have a SA joint event with SEMA, uh, which is our student competition. So we'll be displaying the formula as well as Baja cars. We also have a joint career fair for the activity and that will take place on the Saturday 23rd from approximately 10 to 5 p.m. And then uh, the first week of May, uh, we have a collaboration with ACT, which is Advanced Clean Transportation Expo, it will be held in Long Beach the weekend of the 9th through 12th. And also SAE members will receive a discount uh, once during registration. Uh, for the two discounts mentioned, uh, as SA members, you have to go in and activate your email notifications. Once you register for those two particular events, you'll receive an email uh, with, with your discount codes. So just a point of information uh, for the membership. Also, our social media presence, you can find us on our website, www.saesocal.org, or LinkedIn, Facebook, and we also have a YouTube channel. For those interested in joining SA, uh, you see our membership link. I'm also uh, the meeting and tours vice chair. You see my email meetings.tours at sa.org. You can contact myself or the membership chair himself, Dean Case, who's not on the event tonight, but uh, his email can be found at membership at sasocal.org. So for those, we, we have about a 40 minute presentation this evening. Shortly thereafter, we'll have a Q&A uh, for our membership interested in asking questions. We ask that you drop the questions into the Q&A section, and then we'll address those uh, as the presenters go through their material. We have actually two speakers tonight. Our, our first speaker is uh, Dave Grannon. He's actually the CEO of Light. Uh, prior to, to Light, Dave was uh, the CEO of Lingo, which is the first national language speech recognition service for mobile phones. The first application being Siri app, as well as uh, Samsung's S Voice product. Previously, he held positions at Nokia and Sprint, as well as GeoWorks. Uh, he began his career in the Marine Corps and currently holds the MBA from Berkeley. Our second presenter will be Boris Adden. He's a senior director of technologies at Light, working on the intersection between R&D and product management. Prior to light, Boris was a technical product manager at HERE, which is a Nokia company, working on connected action cameras and at Microsoft as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Boris and Dave. Hello, Dave. Hello, Delbert. Thank you very much. Boris, how are you? Hi, Delbert. Doing great. Thanks. Okay, guys, uh, if you're able and willing, you can queue up your presentation and we can start. Yes, able and willing. Let me uh, pull up and share my screen. Delbert, just make sure you can see this all right. Yeah, you're on, Dave. Okay, great. Well, well thanks again, Delbert, and to SAE and for everybody watching. Um, again, my name is Dave Grant, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Light. Um, and I thought what I would do is just uh, take about five, six minutes to give an overview of our company. Uh, so you have some context about what it is we do. And then we'll get to the really fun and interesting stuff, which is Boris uh, doing his demos. And, and Boris is kind of our demo king in the company. He, he knows this technology inside and out, both as an engineer and a, a uh, product uh, person uh, wrapped into one. Uh, and, and that will be the exciting stuff. I, I promise you, we, we always like um, 
what, what Boris uh, comes up with. But uh, let me put it in context for you. Um, so at Light, we are a depth sensing company for uh, automotive uh, assisted and autonomous driving. And um, our mission statement at the company is to enable machines to see like humans only better. And when we make that statement, we mean it figuratively, but, but actually we also mean it literally because our, our technology really is a form of biomimicry. And uh, that's what you're gonna hear about today is a, a unique approach. No one in the market to our knowledge is approaching the, the depth sensing problem in the same way. Um, and that is by using just uh, conventional cameras, uh, automotive grade cameras that ship in the channels today and using two or more of these cameras, uh, seeing the world at the same time to develop and derive depth or distance to objects. So again, back to the biomimicry, as humans, we see because we have two eyes and any object we look at at any given time, we're seeing it from two slightly different perspectives. And it's that, uh, that, that different perspective that allows us to sense depth in the world. Um, and that's a process known as parallax. And it turns out we can do the same things with cameras, only at much greater range and with much greater accuracy than the human eyes can work. So this is the way we approach the depth sensing uh, problem. Um, now, for many of you, 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 you may know if you've got a background in this area, this is a, a, a version of stereo uh, depth sensing or stereo vision. And these principles, of course, have been known for more than 100 years. Um, and there are even some stereo solutions in the automotive market today, but they're very limited. Um, and uh, for example, the key limits today in stereo systems is they don't have a very far range because uh, people haven't solved the problem companies have enough how you have what we call a wide baseline, how you put the cameras far apart. The farther apart you put the cameras, the farther uh, you can see down the road. Um, and particularly when you put the cameras very far apart, you have to do what we call satelliting them, meaning they're no longer on a common uh, rigid uh, structure. Uh, most of the stereo, in fact, all of the stereo solutions in the market today are short baseline, maybe no more than about 35 centimeters on a common rigid structure. And this is done because when you get into the harsh real world of driving with temperature extremes and vibration, for stereo systems to derive depth, you have to keep these cameras calibrated. That's a lot easier to do when they're close together on a common solid structure. Very, very hard problem and before light hasn't been solved of how you keep these wide baseline cameras that are not on a, a common structure um, how you keep them calibrated. You cannot have uncorrelated vibration and rotation of these cameras and still do stereo. If you have uncorrelated vibration rotation, so long as you can calibrate, you can handle that. And that's a key problem we've solved in this, uh, in, in this area that allows us to give very, very long ranging information with stereo. Another breakthrough we've had is we've incorporated a third camera, so you can use two or three cameras. And then finally, most stereo systems in the world today um, are very good at edge detection. So they, you can detect the silhouette of the pedestrian, the bicyclist, the car, and distance to that, that edge. And then uh, companies or technologies use regularization or filling. You kind of assume the depth of the distance is the same for that entire structure, the whole car, the whole person. And that's not very precise. With our technology, we've developed some breakthrough and signal processing algorithms that allow us to measure the depth to every pixel in a scene uh, that, that the cameras are seeing. So uh, this is um, just a little bit uh, of an overview of what Light does as a company why our technology is very different than anything that's come before and, and what some of the breakthroughs are. Um, we go to market with a, a platform we call Clarity to, um, to do this. And as I said, uh, this is a camera only platform. And one of the most common misconceptions that people have the first time they meet light 
they hear about using cameras only to determine distance to, to, to objects and depth in a scene. And they think of maybe the way Tesla does this or the way Mobileye does this using neural networks and machine learning. And so they'll ask us, well, gee, how many million miles have you driven to train your models? And the answer is none, right? Again, we don't work this way. We are using the concepts of trigonometry and epipolar geometry uh, to measure depth of every pixel in a physics-based measured way. Uh, we don't use inferencing. Uh, we think that's got its own set of challenges. And as I mentioned, range, given that we can maintain these wide baselines, we can range uh, over a kilometer away. And so again, a lot of people initially think, oh, well, in assisted driving and self-driving, why do you need that? It turns out there are a number of key use cases. The most uh, obvious is class eight uh, long haul trucking. So these are your semi-tractor trailers and an L4 environment, a geofenced, for example, stretch of highway where um, those trucks uh, are going for long, long runs. And on a slick highway, one of these big rigs can take 350 meters to come to a stop. The best in class LIDARs uh, today can only effectively range to about 200 meters. If it takes you 350 meters to come to a stop, that's a problem you're running in a very suboptimal way. Um, and also, Boris will show some of this. We have about 20 times the detail of LIDAR in any given frame. And this is critical because there are a lot of common use cases that uh, we just haven't solved yet with LIDAR. You know, if I want to see, say, a low contrast item like a, uh, uh, a discarded tire or, or tread of tire on the freeway uh, that's 100 meters away, you know, that's not a big object. It's very low contrast. LIDARs, for example, have a hard time with that. That's something that's a very, very much a use case solved by clarity. And, and the price point is also very, um, very much for auto, especially L2, L2 plus L3 kinds of solutions. You know, we're not at a point yet where an entry level car that maybe is a twenty twenty five thousand dollars car and you want to do some basic L2 plus thing like automatic emergency braking, uh, LIDARs are still prohibitively expensive. Our solution really is the cost of um, the cameras that, and usually today cars are already going to have at least one camera facing in a given direction. So there might be an incremental camera that needs to be uh, built for or bought for the solution and the light clarity processing, which uh, Boris will talk a little bit more about. So again, that, that in a nutshell is an overview of, of light um, and uh, what we do and how we're different. And as I like to say, you've all suffered through and now paid the price of admission, which is having to listen to me as a talking head, Babylon. And now for what's really interesting and hopefully you came for is to see Boris uh, share some demos with us. So I will stop sharing and turn it over to my colleague, Boris. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Let me know when you can see my screen. I can see it, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so hopefully now everybody is a bit clearer about what we may be talking about, but now we'll see details and we'll start right away. Um, first of all, I'll mention that I'm using uh, an application we've built. It's web-based. We call it In-Depth Analyzer uh, for accessing the data. And this is actually the way all of our licensees access the data that they capture with our platform. And to demonstrate uh, the Clarity platform itself, we'll start with this scene. This is a test track in Concord, California, Gomentum. Uh, they have this long straight, and we needed something like that, a closed circuit where we can do tests because we were testing um, one of our earlier uh, arrays, uh, clarity arrays for a far forward facing perception. So here in the top left, you can see that we are using three cameras, which is a value add of clarity supporting more than two cameras in a stereo configuration, which we can discuss more later. And the center camera is what we would call the reference. So all the uh, points of view that you will see, images and depth maps, or uh, what we call pixel depths, they are from the point of view of the reference camera. And then we have two additional cameras which are used for uh, the depth reconstruction. One is left 38 centimeters and one is right 50 centimeters. So in total, we're talking about the array which is 88 centimeters wide, which is not something that you, you can buy uh, these days as they mentioned. In addition, uh, cameras are narrow field of view, uh, 32 degrees horizontal. 
and they're high resolution, 7.1 uh, megapixels. So intended for being able to see far as, uh, as example that they've had, how do we break uh, at 300 meters if we cannot see that far? Uh, and so I'll play this video sequence so you can see how it looks like from the camera view. I'm playing this at half the frame rate just because we're running over Zoom and it would be overly choppy otherwise. So we placed a bunch of objects and we have people around cars. Um, you will see here we have pieces of tire. Uh, there's a big vibration event here. So uh, an interesting scene. And uh, what I did not mention before, you can see from GPS here that we're driving 60 plus miles an hour. So it's a high speed test. That's exactly why we wanted the closed circuit. What we can do now is we can play this clip back, but I'll play it as a pixel depth. So what you're seeing now is per frame with no temporal awareness, computed depth, where uh, we are using three cameras, they're capturing in a synchronized manner, uh, processing depth using signal processing only, there is no machine learning to compute the depth here. And we are displaying it here as a color map I'll play it one more time, where, uh, and you'll see this across all of our data sets, red is for near and uh, deep blue is for further away. And notice that even though we are processing everything uh, temporally unaware, it's very smooth. You don't, see, uh, you don't see blue areas in the front, you don't see red areas in the back, objects do not pop in and out of existence. Uh, it's actually quite nice. And it's so detailed and dense that even just looking at this as an image, you can actually tell what are pretty much all the objects that, that you can see on the road or around it. You can see what, what are cars, what are pedestrians. It's very dense. Uh, there is no, this is raw depth. There is no post-processing. There is no regularization. There is no interpolation. Uh, what clarity can measure, we report. What we cannot measure, uh, we, uh, we leave blank. Uh, basically, you, you'll see uh, like uh, black, uh, black areas in the screen. Okay, so, um, now we'll take a look at a particular frame of interest. This is a, a nice frame, it's very detailed. Um, I will go to what we call detail view, where instead of looking at the uh, temporal data like here, we go into, we freeze one frame in time where three cameras captured at the same time. The de depth was computed from the three cameras and we can now inspect the depth data itself in more detail. Um, I'll just, uh, Point, point out here, we have additional sensors on the test vehicle, which are used for, for capturing reference data, but only images are used for the data, processed data that you will see today. So everything is strictly from camera images alone. So here we see what the image looks like from the reference camera, just nicely post-processed for, uh, for viewing. And as I'm moving over the image, uh, notice in this panel on the left, we can show you what the raw 3D coordinate as measured by clarity in the scene is. Uh, so for example, here we can see what the license plate on the Mazda is, it's 18 meters versus uh, this small uh, dot on the road that's 14.8 versus this traffic cone, which is 28.2. Uh, plus you have the, uh, the left, right, and uh, up and down also uh, location for this. Uh, clarity doesn't know what it is, it is looking at. It doesn't know that this is a license plate, doesn't know this is a road, it just looks at individual pixels in different cameras and by comparing them uh, using uh, nominally speaking, the standard stereo ideas, of course, we've done a lot of innovation both on, on all aspects to make it as good as it is. Uh, we compute what that depth is. In addition, what we also provide, you can see below the depth values, we provide a confidence value, which is a value essentially between zero and one uh, because clarity operates as a, as a probabilistic method, the algorithms, algorithms itself are probabilistic, we can effectively measure how reliably do we think that we've measured this particular depth value. And this is also provided to our customers as uh, output from the, from the platform, which can be used either to filter out points which are below a desired threshold or as an input to downstream perception engine, right? Because different points uh, you would want to take with different amount of weights, uh, which would be then guided by the contents. So we have, uh, we have this camera image. This is from the reference camera as mentioned, the center camera in this case. We have the depth map, which is here. Uh, because the depth is computed from an image, comes as no surprise, they are essentially aligned. There is no additional fusion needed. Uh, and we can then create what we call a pixel cloud, which is a uh, essentially a very dense point cloud, but with a color image overlay. So what are we talking about here? This is one frame I wanna stress. There is no temporal aggregation of points to, to, to densify the data. And in this one frame, given that most of the sky is 
is gone because uh, half of the field of view is in the sky, we are getting 930,000 points. This is just in this frame. Uh, comparing to that, our state-of-the-art uh, 128 uh, channel spinning LiDAR in this frame, in, so uh, in this portion of the field of view, of course, the spinning LiDAR does full 360, but for this field of view, we only get 3,100 points. And we will take a look at that uh, in, a, in a second. Now, this is a full 3D data. As you can see, as I move around, you can see how uh, where every object is in 3D and also the color of that object. Um, and there is no computational cost to get that aligned. Um, just one more thing to point out, I would imagine everybody on the call is pro has probably seen point clouds in the past. So there are these areas, uh, especially these big ones behind uh, 3D structures in, the, in, the, in this 3D world, in 3D representation. They are shadows, and they are a result of occlusion of the reference camera. So obviously, we have visible spectrum cameras. Uh, we cannot penetrate through objects with, with the visible rays. So wherever there is something occluding, uh, the view we cannot measure behind, right? But it's a very good indicator of presence of 3D structure. So we can see clearly because of this very big shadow here, there is something in front and it's, it, this is indeed this, uh, this Mazda vehicle. Same thing for these, for example, traffic cones and we'll see those uh, across the board. Okay, so uh, I mentioned, uh, mentioned a comparison to, to LiDAR um, and it, it is this particular LiDAR that we have on our vehicle. Uh, and we can turn on that layer. So I will turn off pixel cloud just for a second. Let me increase the point size for LiDAR. So hopefully you can see this. So this is everything you will get from a state-of-the-art spinning LiDAR in this frame, right? So if you don't do any temporal aggregation of points uh, inside this portion of the field of view, right? So if you're interested in uh, narrow field of view like we have here for far forward facing applications, this is, this is pretty much it. As I mentioned, this is 3,100 3, points. So of course, uh, LiDAR is, as everybody knows, in the range that it supports, it's very accurate. We're talking about 10, 15, 20 centimeter level accuracy. And so one of the, one of the principal questions we always get, well, uh, especially for automotive um, applications, how well does clarity compare to LiDAR? So there are many ways to compare that, but we'll take a look at a few examples here. So first, let's take a look at what does it look like uh, on the road? One of the critical applications uh, let me just reduce the point size slightly for better visibility. One of the critical applications of any uh, any autonomous system or, or even a level two, level three system is just knowing uh, what is the drivable road ahead? Where can I go? Uh, does the road stop or is there an obstacle? Stuff like that. So we want to know uh, how well do we reconstruct the road? And so imagine we are crawling like on all fours uh, and looking at what the, what the road surface looks like. So as you can see, LiDAR and Clarity are describing the same surface. Uh, of course, Clarity, because of its much higher uh, density, much higher angular resolution of the cameras that, that we use for this application, we have a lot more points of depth in between every two LiDAR points. But you know, so far, so good. They are, they are matching very well uh, overall. And so as we keep going further, um, the density uh, advantage of Clarity is maintained. Um, but they are still matching very well. Now we come to a first interesting point. Uh, first of all, I want to point out this 3D structure on the left. So there are no LiDAR points on the structure. As you can see, it's just too small, uh, but Clarity definitely uh, sees something uh, in three dimensions effectively or measures something. And what we're talking about here, as, as Dave mentioned, one of the key aspects uh, of any, uh, any perception, any sensing and perception system is can it detect very difficult objects, such as uh, lower effectivity tires on the road, uh, especially at long distances and at high speeds? And to really make this job really difficult here, we've also flattened this tire. So we cut out the sides so, so we can make it as flat as possible on the road. And as you can see that from uh, the pixel cloud data, there is this 3D structure measured by clarity. So this will be uh, very this is very different from the neighboring road, so it's easy to see that there is something there, and it will be a signal that can be used by the perception, perception system downstream for making decisions about avoiding such an object. But in addition, you can notice that at this point, and this is at 53 meters approximately, uh, LiDAR returns simply stop. Uh, and on the road, just to be clear, obviously for uh, different kinds of objects, uh, when the angle of incidence of the laser light is not as shallow, uh, there will be returns, but on the road, because not enough laser light reflects, we don't get any returns. Whereas clarity, because it can see the road, it can measure the road. And I can keep going uh, as long as as long as the road is visible, we can measure it. 
And now we come to the second interesting po point here, which is this 3D structure. This is uh, at 109 and a half meters, uh, right next to this pedestrian. That is, that is how we uh, position them. And as you can see, they're actually right next to each other. So very spatially consistent, even though you know, we're, not under, we're not aware that that is the situation, we're just measuring it. Uh, and what that is, it's another tire, just much further away. This is 110 meters, uh, also very, uh, very low contrast. It's very difficult to say kind of how would you looking at pixels see this, but Clarity is, uh, is able to uh, find it uh, just uh, no, with no issues. Once again, uh, as it happens, the object is too small and too far away, uh, and we don't get lighter returns uh, on this object. One more comparison we can uh, take a look at very quickly is uh, we will see this uh, cyclist object. Now, because we are we're running just a, uh, we're running a sensing solution, we don't actually have a full perception engine running downstream. As you can see, there is a slight offset in lighter alignment here, but this is uh, less important. What we are more interested in is how well do they, do they align in depth? And uh, when we look at the depth points, as you can see here, our uh, clarity, and LiDAR are basically spot on, uh, matching very well. This is at 55 meters. So you're getting all of these, uh, all of these points. You're, as you can see here, you can easily tell that this is a cyclist, even just from, from this data, uh, because we have the image data and the depth data combined, uh, and the accuracy uh, of LiDAR to match. In addition, there is this uh, well, partially occluded, uh, because the cyclist is blocking the, tra the pole of the traffic sign. Once again, you can see that they are matching very well. But there is the third object in between this, um, this very thin pole, which once again, uh, and I'll move this way, once again, the pole is too thin and is simply not visible uh, for the LiDAR because of the angular resolution, but Clarity is correctly placing it in between the cyclist and the traffic sign in the back. Hey, Boris, a couple questions came in as you were speaking. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the range being in one kilometer, but the one question from our membership is how long or how far in the future do you anticipate extending this range? Uh, so th that is a very good question uh, and uh, maybe a, a bit of explanation here. So the range is uh, essentially dependent on the camera system you select. Uh, in order to get such ranges, you need to use, you know, you need more pixels, high resolution, and you would need narrow, narrow field of view lens. and you also need um, a wide baseline in order to this be in order to be able to see the disparity shift or the parallax effect effectively uh, between those two viewpoints. Uh, and so, uh, in in one uh, in one camera pair, if you will, uh, it is not possible to have both the ten centimeter range and the one kilometer range. Right? You kind of have to pick your the range that you are uh, the subset of the range that you are you are interested in. Uh, alternatively, you can add a third camera and that can help extend the range. That's one thing we can discuss in more detail. Now, uh, we're saying one kilometer, actually, we just put a number because that's already uh, industry leading. Um, we, can measure, uh, ob we can measure structures which are far beyond that. There are some data sets, for example, where we see bridges uh, two kilometers in, uh, two and a half kilometers in, uh, ahead, and we get uh, you know, within like 10% uh, of those, as long as they're visible in the cameras and as long as there is enough uh, baseline Distance, be distance between cameras and resolution, optically speaking, or angular resolution, uh, there is no effectively no limitation to how far uh, clarity can see. Now, of course, uh, there is a limit to how wide of a system you can put on, a, say, a moving vehicle. Right? There is you cannot put a three meter system uh, that easily, so there will be a limit from that perspective. But uh, it's by and large governed by the choice of optics and the choice of the array placement. Okay, also another question regarding, you mentioned combining the data with imaging for object detection. Are there any other applications uh, utilized with combining the depth perception data? Uh, so that is a great question. Uh, as Dave mentioned already, we are, uh, we are in the sensing, dom we are operating the sensing dom domain first and foremost, right? Perception is, would be a downstream stack which can take all of this information and make, make, make decisions about what it actually, what the scene actually contains and what are the conditions of the scene. And so um, just to maybe talk a bit more about this, um, we, we firmly believe that the sensing and perceiving task or understanding of the scene, like sensing what's in the scene is one aspect, but understanding the scene is another, that they uh, do not, uh, not that they should, they do not have to be combined, but that they even shouldn't be combined. 
that's too much heavy lifting for, for one system effectively. And so if you have image data like this, which is just a regular image, but you can per pixel combine it with this data, which tells you how far away something is, how large is it? Because from here, for example, I can measure the height of this person, right? So I can, I can tell that this is not a five meter poster, even though it looks very realistically like a person at, at 55 meters, I can tell this is one point, you know, 1.8 meter uh, high or tall uh, a 3D structure, right? That combining that as input into perception can provide a lots of benefits from uh, better uh, false positive, false negative rates to actually even improving uh, and or simplifying training because you may need less training data if you have more information for every uh, every training data set that you are using. Right. For just to just to illustrate the example further, you know, if you want to be able to detect a car like this, you need to be able to see a car of this color from many, many, many different distances, from many different angles, right, at different times of day. That is a lot of different conditions, and this is just for you know this kind of car. What if you change the color? What if it's a newer Mazda three, uh, right, or Mazda six, which is larger? Right, there are all the all of these var varieties. Uh, which increase the training data set. But if you have the 3D size and perfect and very dense and combined with the image data, you can use that to train uh, a model more efficiently with less training data. So those would be ways that, uh, that uh, our customers and like uh, ourselves are looking into uh, you know, how we can use this data uh, for downstream systems. Okay. We also have an additional question. Uh, is your reference distance data LIDAR based, or do you take frames from the reference points during testing to have known distance to target objects? So that is a good question. We obviously, you know, when, when we are just driving about uh, in regular streets or cities and all that, we cannot have, uh, we cannot have measured uh, scenes. So there we rely on, on LIDAR or we have the GPS as you can see here. So we can extract for some, um, some fixed objects like buildings or traffic poles, traffic signs, we can extract, extract GPS data from there. Uh, but by and large, we, uh, we rely on, on LIDAR as a, uh, as a reference. Okay, great. Um, I think our next question is, can you expound more on environmental impacts such as sunlight, rain, weather? Oh, that is a perfect question. Uh, I will leave the answer to that for later because we will show you some examples. Uh, so hopefully that will you know, answer, some, answer that question better, or we can discuss it uh, in the final Q&A, maybe in more detail. Okay, no problem. Continue on, Boris, as you okay. wish. Thank you, Delbert. Okay, so um, one thing that uh, I can show before we uh, move on. So as I mentioned before, we have depth, but we also have the confidence map. And this is what a confidence map looks like, uh, actually. So this is what... As I mentioned, all, the, all of our customers get to see. So for a pixel, wherever there is a depth value, we also get the confidence value. And you, this is yet another input that can be used for a perception system to make even better decisions, right? Knowing which points to trust more versus which points to trust less. Okay, so uh, let's uh, continue with a few more things. This scene is really a, a gold mine of, of interesting content. So um, one thing I will, jump to next is looking at uh, the fine detail that you, you're able to extract with clarity. So this road here is a pretty flat road. As you can see, there is a, you know, a bit of bumping, uh, bumps and uh, wobbliness later on, but here it's pretty, pretty smooth and we're getting a very nice smooth reconstruction from, uh, from clarity. But right uh, on the right side of this white line, there is a small couple of centimeter drop. And then there is a, actually a, a further drop, which gets actually quite steep. Uh, after the fact. And so clarity uh, is, as you can see, seeing a gap. Uh, so this black area here, there is an occlusion on the reference camera, which cannot see this area because there is a, there is a small step here. And this, this, um, this gap goes all the way to the second uh, traffic cone, which is uh, 28 meters ahead. And I can actually measure this height. And this is really rough, right? Without any filtering on any kind of post-processing, this particular point is 1.92 meters below the reference camera. And let's pick another point here. This one is 1.89. So we're talking about, 20, about two centimeters of, of height here. Uh, and 
you know any point we pick here along the along the way, we get uh, pretty much the same uh, the same results here. So we're seeing very small road features. Uh, and by the way, this is, for example, this point is at uh, 13 and a half, 14 meters away. So at these distances, 14 meters away of the of the camera, and even further, we can see centimeter level uh, kinds of um, differences on surfaces without understanding that we are looking on the left at the asphalt and on the right on dirt. Uh, and then furthermore, we are, I'll just go lower, so below the road level, we are able to see this curved sloping downwards uh, on the on the of the profile very nicely here. You can see it in the 3D data. And everywhere where you see uh, the shadow, there's actually a bit a small kind of a bump in between or, or be in front of that from the point of view of the reference camera. And that's why we have a shadow. So you can see that it's, it's actually really bumpy, first of all. And then there is a big drop. And in fact, if you look at these points at the bottom here, they are at 2.6 meters below. So we are talking about almost 70 centimeter difference in height between the road surface at the edge uh, and uh, the, uh, the bottom here. So if you think about something where you're having um, more rural applications, off-roading, or even non-strictly non automotive, like precision, precision agriculture or something like that, you may want to, from this data, decide to go more this way, closer to the road because it's flatter and you know what the profile is rather than trying to go straight through because the depth differential here is huge and it might have an impact on the, uh, on the suspension and on the wheels or the bottom of the vehicle gets scraped. Okay, uh, one more uh, interesting view of this scene. Uh, what we can also do just for, just for fun is we can clip uh, the data by range. So what we are showing now is we're only showing data which is within a certain range as we define it. Uh, currently it's between the front plane and the back plane, it is 50 meters. I will make it 10, so to make it much smaller. And the center, uh, now we can kind of move the center of this clipping plane. So at the moment it's at 25 meters and we can see how objects pop in and out inside the appropriate bucket. So here we have you know, uh, at nine meters center, we have the road. And as we move forward, there is the Mazda. Uh, we have the traffic uh, cones appearing. There is the traffic light, sign on the left, the car. Uh, now we have object number one here, the cyclist, as you can see, uh, appearing. Uh, there is another object, the pole, which is in between. Now there is a traffic sign. So everything is in its appropriate bucket. And as you can see, this is exactly the kind of the, the kind of data. Uh, this is just in depth. You can do you could do the same in the other uh, the other two dimensions that can provide you some sense of scale for how big are objects, uh, depending on where in the scene they are and where in the image they are. And now we come to an interesting part here. Notice here on the left, there is a structure appearing. And it, as it appears, it starts going upwards. And that is because this is a slanted side of this building. I'll turn off clipping for a second. This is an old Navy base. Uh, so this is a bunker. And as you can see here, we as humans, we have the context. So we can say that this is slanted. But clarity is just by looking at you know, some pixels here in, multi, in, in a multi, in three camera array here, it's actually able to correctly measure that the top is further away than the bottom, as you can see here. The bottom appears first, and then it grows to the top. So we are measuring the slant of a very nondescript surface uh, on the side of the road. And, and this is, by the way, 110 meters uh, average, 120 now, 105 at the bottom, uh, with no problem. So moving further, we have, here's a small, um, this is a stroller, we have a pedestrian, this is at 113 meters. Here we have one car in the center appearing, and then behind it now, there will be, you can see it here, partially occluded car, also visible. And then behind it, there is a third car, also visible. Uh, we are now at 170 meters. And so now we will see though there is occlusion from the traffic sign, the same thing happens with the, the next bunker at 230 meters. The bottom appears first and then the top. And so uh, as we keep going, here is another, uh, another vehicle at 270 meters. Now there's far less content in, in, in a scene like this, but we'll see some trees appearing. Here's a tree at 340. Uh, there is uh, going to be another tree, a couple of trees and another bunker. This is 380 uh, meters. And this scene doesn't have much more useful content after this. It's too flat. But as you can see, all the way up to 400 meters, we are easily seeing where in 10 meter slices, where things fit uh, and having that as input, uh, for any kind of downstream decision system or perception system would be or could be very beneficial. Okay, so this was the 
The first scene, uh, a lot of content here, but it's uh, even this one frame, as you can see, provides very rich amount of information and, and one can play with this for a long time. Uh, now I will switch gears and this, this goes well with a question that was asked. Well, uh, before you switch, before mm -hmm. switching yeah. boards, a couple other questions may be applicable. Uh, I see you providing depth as well as color information. Uh, what's, what's the advantages of, of those two uh, data points, color as well as depth? Uh, well, so that goes uh, that goes back to uh, to the to the point that, that I mentioned before. Right? So the depth is um, uh, depth provides information from the camera perspective, where everything in the scene, which is visible to the camera, is effectively. Uh, and when you have both, so just from looking at this depth map, even if you didn't have the color information, as long as you had, uh, or maybe actually better way to demonstrate that, that is from here. Uh, what I can do here is I can colorize this by depth rather than by color, right? And so now we have a point cloud where everything is colored by its uh, distance from the reference camera, right? So just from this kind of data, we can make decisions on, is there something, for example, straight ahead, right? As we can see here, the road, whatever it is ahead, we, we cannot know it's a road just from the depth data necessarily, but whatever it is, it is clear. Right, I can go forward. Whereas if I were if I were to turn left and go this way, there is a 3D structure here, so I shouldn't go that way. And now combining that with the camera data, we can do, which once again probably easiest to just show from this view here. Combining that with the camera data, we can make better decisions. Not only do we know that there is something there, is a 3D structure from the image or the color data, we can we can uh, with machine learning models. Uh, which combine bo both, we can infer what is it. Because just, just because something is there doesn't mean that it should be something that we react to, right? For example, there could be, uh, if there's a cardboard box, probably you want to stop because, or avoid, you don't know what it may be, right? It could be filled with something really heavy. But if it's just a plastic bag fluttering in the wind, we'll see the 3D data, but from overall perception engine, we would decide based on image and depth data together uh, and additional cues that, well, this is not worth worrying about. Right? But both image and depth data can help in making those decisions better in, for downstream, downstream systems. OK. Uh, another question from a participant. Can you use Clarity Platform with uh, dash cams? Uh, so Clarity, uh, because it does not rely on uh, machine learning, right? it relies on stereo processing, at a minimum requires two cameras. Right, two cameras which are uh, calibrated, um, and then we derive depth. Uh, with dash cams, they typically are single camera uh, systems, so that that would not work with clarity. Okay. But as far as the uh, and I don't know, Dave, maybe uh, you want to jump in on uh, hardware selection uh, for a comment. Yeah, I, I think the um, and, and there was another question I, I saw uh, as well about. Um, it's uh, allowing the uh, adaptive beat headlights in the US, uh, in the United States, with a camera in each headlamp. And, and somebody asked, you know, could we use those cameras and one in the windshield to implement clarity? And, and the answer is, um, you know, we do have a set of design rules um, for, for uh, our technology um, at light. And, and if, if there's time today, we can go th through a quick demo of what we call our designer tool. If not, we can um, point people to it on our website. But, uh, but to generally give you the out outline, um, we have a, a tool that any of our customers can use where they put in you know, kind of their requirements. How far do they want to see with what level of accuracy and what minimal size object at a given distance? You know, I wanna see something maybe 16 square uh, centimeters at 100 meters, for example. Based on those requirements, we will generate um, uh, a recommendation for number of cameras, two in a given direction or array, two cameras or three cameras, uh, the, what we believe the resolution of those cameras should be to meet the need, you know, three, four, eight megapixels, whatever it is, um, the uh, baseline or distances of how far apart the cameras are, and generally, you know, make some recommendation about currently shipping cameras in the industry. And then within that, um, generally speaking, um, for the headlight example, uh, these would be cameras that exist. Uh, the cameras 
generally have to be on the, the same horizontal or vertical plane. We can do either, but uh, you know, having headlamps and then the windshield, that offset would be too far for our design rules. But you could think, you know, the 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 center grill of the, the front grill of the car and the two headlights. If you want a three camera array, it works perfectly there. If a two camera array fits the need, um, that that's fine as well. So so again, a number of design rules that um, that we find are, are very with within tolerances as well, right? And we find that all the tier ones and OEMs we work with have no problem fitting into the tolerances that, that we're prescribing for these arrays, but, but standard off-the-shelf cameras uh, within the design rules are how we work. Okay, great, great. I think there was another question, follow-up question from the same gentleman, Dave. Uh, is there a measurable difference or measurable or significant difference in the time of detection given the lack of need to send a signal and, and get a reflection? Yeah, Boris, you want to take that? Uh, yes. So um, the our clarity processing works with uh, very low lags. We're talking uh, sub one frame. Uh, and in fact, as you're you know reading out the sensor data, we can process inline as the data is coming in because we don't rely on the whole frame to be available. For example, which may be needed for certain more global uh, global methods and things like that. Now, the amount of processing that is required is even if it's signal processing is really large because we're dealing with a lot of pixels here um, for something like LiDAR, it's much simpler plus processing. So it's not exactly comparable because of that, but we're talking about very low latencies. Okay, great. I think it's a good transition into your environmental impacts section, Boris, uh, if you wish. Okay, thank you. So first uh, first example of environmental impact is what happens when there is uh, some, some water around. Uh, so rain uh, situation. This is now a slightly different array. Uh, as you can see here, this is a 95 centimeter end-to-end uh, -end baseline, so even wider than the previous one. Uh, and uh, once again, the rest, center camera is uh, reference. And this is now running um, tier one automotive uh, rolling shutter cameras, which are production, uh, production level. So uh, we work with those that's preferred, in fact, as they uh, explained. And so let's play the sequence as video, and I will switch to pixel depth. Now you will see once again, what the depth looks like um, with you know, very wet roads and the rain around, what the depth, depth looks like from clarity. Now what you're seeing here is, first and foremost, first I would wanna point out that uh, every object of interest, all vehicles and traffic signs, traffic lights, uh, curbs even, uh, everything is uh, clearly visible as well as it was in the previous scene, which had no environmental impact. Um, and maybe here is a, a good pausing point. I will find a frame which has LiDAR data. Um, and we can see that there are um, gaps or if you will, uh, black areas on the road. Those are a consequence of uh, reflections. Uh, sometimes, so the, what Clarity relies on as a, as a basic principle is that there is exactly one depth value uh, in that part of the scene that can be attributed to it. And so if you have a, uh, if you will, partial reflection where both the road and the reflected object is visible, then we cannot make a determination of what it is because we don't know that we are looking at the road. Right? We cannot make that call. So rather than try to provide a wrong depth, we simply remove it. And you can see that here uh, and here, wherever there is reflection. Now, when there is a very strong reflection, such as headlights, for example, from this vehicle here, you can see there, uh, there is this area here, then we will measure the reflected uh, object distance. Uh, and you'll see that in the 3D point cloud in a second. So I will load uh, the detail view here. Just takes, uh, uh, just takes a moment. And on the internet speed. Okay, this, we have a, with live demos, occasionally there is a refresh of the page. Uh, bear with me for one second. Uh, it will load again. In, uh... No problem. While they look. Yeah, well, that's loading, uh, Delbert. One other question I saw. Yeah, how go ahead. With, yeah, how do you deal with the vibration if the cameras are bumped out of alignment? You mentioned long baselines, be lots of vibration. So that, that's a great question. 
that's one of the key problems we've solved. So again, um, uh, the, um, the, the, we, we have developed algorithms uh, and um, uh, for what we call uh, runtime calibration. So 30 frames a second, frame by frame, we are uh, calculating uh, the, the relative pitch on roll of those cameras and, um, and calibrating for any uncorrelated vibration. Now we do have solutions. You can do this on visual odometry alone. We can do it on that alone. But some of our customers to make the system even more robust and fault tolerant, um, we include uh, in the camera enclosure an IMU uh, in, in, with the camera module. And this is like you know a, a sub a single digit you know a few dollar part uh, IMU that allows us to have a much more robust. Uh, uh, calibration solution. Uh, obviously, there are limits, like all things. You know, it's it's physics, not magic. If if, if the vehicle took a severe blow or a direct impact, uh, you know, to a structure near a camera, you know, then we, we would have a, a, a fail-safe uh, mode to uh, alert the driver that the system no longer works and they're going to have to go in for service. But but thus far, we've been able to withstand uh, quite harsh and rugged uh, conditions in our testing, including off-roading. So uh, more on that later, but it looks like Boris has got his demo working again. Thank you, Dave. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at, uh, I here chosen another frame. Um, either, either frame works in principle. Uh, we have here uh, pixel depth. Once again, we can see some um, Missing areas on the road, though a lot of the road is reconstructed, especially further down the street, because uh, <clears throat> there is there are less reflection uh, moments or reflection objects uh, there. Uh, and then when we look at the pixel cloud, we can see that we are getting the road where we are reconstructing the road. We're getting it very nicely. Uh, it's uh, at the at the right right level, as you can see here. Now we do get some, especially for very very strong reflections, we will measure the distance to the reflected object. But if you look in 3D, the distance to this object is exactly the same as the distance to the source, which is what you would expect, right? The distance to the mirrored object is the same as the distance to the object, or depth, sorry, not distance, depth, is the same as the depth of the object uh, that you were, uh, that was mirrored. But what is interesting here is we, if we turn on LiDAR, uh, notice that when we go uh, below the road. Once again, we will uh, get LiDAR showing reflections as well, because it just that, that's how the laser optically reflected. Uh, what you will notice even more, and I'll turn off pixel cloud, is that apart from these points, which are re reflectors on the road, as you can see here, we have reflectors on the road. Apart from those, there are no other points on the road. So the road is basically empty. So uh, it's um, very interesting to see uh, that uh, it can be very difficult to make such a determination uh, on what the depth of certain uh, areas of the scene is just based on, for example, in this case, LiDAR data, whereas clarity itself is wherever uh, it uh, can un in unambiguously measure the depth of the road, has measured it and measured it very nicely. Uh, and once again, we can see uh, very good alignment. And uh, when you look at you know, more complex objects, as you can see, there is a, there are a lot more a lot more points of depth, uh, and with the color, you can get a full structure understanding, and you don't need to do any fusion. All of it is all of that is available um, for free uh, in this kind of data. So one thing we can do here is, for example, we can take a look at uh, how how far away certain objects are now because of, because we're not running full perception. Sometimes there is a, there can be a small lidar misalignment. You know, we for testing we can do that manually, uh, but it just requires a bit more precision than I'm currently providing. Okay, so for example, you can see this traffic sign uh, here on the left. You will see the statistics for the for the for this bounding box. You can see that the uh, lidar is uh, setting it at sixty point five eight meters, whereas clarity is sixty point four five meters. So that's pretty much. Uh, exactly the same there. Uh, you know, we can take a look at a small, same size object here. Once again, we see uh, 62.7 versus 62.2. So uh, once again, the same. 
Um, I uh, saw a question for how to do comparison for very far away objects, especially given the lack of LIDAR returns and or alignment. And that is actually a fair question that is very tricky to do. Um, we often do that manually by inspecting the scenes in pixel clouds and finding uh, finding where, where the data is and finding correspondences. It is not that easy because otherwise it require full uh, mapping of the of the world uh, to know uh, where everything is, uh, which we cannot do for scenes like this. But overall, uh, as long as as long as the cameras, that's essentially a tagline for clarity. We don't do magic, just really good engineering. And as long as the cameras we have see something in the scene, we can measure where it is. And um, the same is the same is true here. Even though it's raining, we are able to see every uh, everything of interest uh, uh, for scene like this. Hey Boris, one more question uh, from our participants: uh, the perception is it engine is it cloud based? Um, so the the perception that we are building is going to be fully or, or automotive ready, running running in the vehicle. Uh, Dave, I don't know if you want to add some more light around that. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So our, our go to market is is in a few ways. So so the the light clarity platform um, uh, it runs on the light clarity uh, D one ASIC. So this is silicon we're designing that tapes out in October. Uh, we have other solutions uh, that are run targeted for SOCs, GPU uh, solutions, for example. And then um, we also uh, license our soft core or RTL. So for, for real-time operational vehicles, um, that there, there are a variety of choices depending on the use case. Typically, customers needing uh, only two versus three cameras lower frame rate and lower resolution will find that a solution running on a GPU uh, that they already ship with their stack in the vehicle is perfectly acceptable. Uh, other customers want you know, for high performance systems, say three cameras streaming at uh, 10 megapixels a piece at 30 frames per second, uh, to do this online calibration, the signal processing I was talking about, you do need dedicated uh, silicon for that. And some of our customers are choosing to license the soft core. They do their own silicon, um, but optimize exactly around what they want. They may only want, for example, um, uh, four megapixel sensors and two of them at 20 frames a second. That's not necessarily a highly performance system, but you can also get that, you know, relatively speaking, on a very inexpensive uh, uh, ASIC with a very low PPA. Uh, power performance area profile. So, you know, it's all about trading off of compute resources. You know, what, what are the other demands on your SOC and central compute in the vehicle versus what you want to isolate offload with an ASIC? Um, uh, some customers choose that. So, so three different flavors of how we can deploy. You mentioned go to market, Dave. Are you anticipating launching the Clarity platform? Uh, are you able to share any timing or? Uh, we anticipate our first commercial launches uh, with non-automotive sectors, and uh, uh, Boris will talk about some of those um, uh, in, in a bit uh, by the end of this year or Q1 uh, next year at the at the latest. Um, for series production, we're looking at uh, for vehicles ADAS and AV series production in 2024. 2024. Okay, great. Okay, All right, Boris. Okay, thank you. So one more example uh, that everybody wants to see usually right away is what happens when you have a bit a bit lower light. Uh, what we are talking about here, you can see here the lux meter we have on the vehicle, once again for, compute, for collecting referential data is well below, below one lux. So it's really dark. Um, in, this particular, in this particular scene, the only source of illumination were the headlights of the test vehicle, which are stock headlights of a Chrysler Pacifica, not retrofitted or anything like that. Uh, and we are moving at 40.5 uh, miles an hour. And as you can see, there is a, a little object here on the right, which we definitely want to be aware of, because if it decides to run on the road, that could be a problem. And so what we can see here is 
Now we have the same reset uh, requirement here. Uh, one second, apologies. And while Boris is doing that, I'll just uh, maybe pick off, uh, if it's okay, Delbert, a couple of other questions I see that I don't think I've answered. Sure. Um, the, um, there's another question around leveraging standardized P-type processing and auto exposure as if the lighting is very low or bad weather. So the, the answer there would be um, uh, no and yes. So no in the sense, and Boris can go into this detail, uh, we, we uh, need to work with the bare uh, image. So we, we need to get the image before the uh, ISP. So uh, we, we can stream through, pass through to an ISP if there's another need on the vehicle system somewhere for um, uh, an ISP processed image. Um, we are leveraging though uh, the other aspects of the sensor, auto exposure and most notably HDR. So for some of those, you know, contrast going in out of a tunnel, uh, bright light, things like that, HDR, very important um, and, and very much leveraged. So that, that's, that's how we work with, with those two dimensions. Yeah, uh, not much to add to, uh, to what uh, they've said. Just uh, a note that uh, a lot of the customers decide to run HDR sensors without any uh, actually auto exposure running. They just use con always constant settings and that works fine for clarity. We, uh, we have uh, tested that uh, with no problems. Uh, and um, part, of the, part of the magic of clarity is the detailed sensor characterization that we go through, which is why we don't want any ISP to uh, change the data on us before we get it. That's why we work directly from raw. Okay, great. Okay. So uh, as mentioned, we have the, the deer here. Uh, we have an empty road, basically very dark scene. So when we go to pixel cloud, you can notice that the scene is uh, reconstructed very well. And what is most important here is just going to uh, our little friend and there is the deer in 3D, uh, fully uh, reconstructed. We have a lot of a lot of points of depth here, uh, and we can see that it's <clears throat> visible, even though it's very very low contrast. Uh, as well as it, as well as the road itself is also visible, even though it's very low contrast. Clarity actually does not need uh, does not need much to be in order to be able to pick up uh, details and compute depth. Uh, and just to make a very quick comparison here. We'll make another very quick bounding box just around the object. And this combines both the foreground and background, but for an interest of time, I'm missing the, one second, easier to zoom in. Okay. So if we look at uh, how well does this compare to LiDAR, we'll see that we are at, I'm getting a, a background object here. Um, I think there is All right, okay. Uh, I was getting a background object uh, and with alignment that's sometimes finicky. Uh, anyway, um, clarity is 70.7 .7 meters, lighter is 72 meters, uh, median values you can see them on the left. And so uh, very good precision or accuracy at 70 meters uh, in very low light conditions, so below one lux. Uh, for this for this particular scene. Okay, and then um, last but not least, something and now for something completely different for those who understand the reference. Um, <laughs> what about completely, you know, out of the left field, something non non automotive? Now, obviously, there are non non automotive applications which are still you know, closer. For example, precision ag or robotics. But here we wanted to showcase what happens when you just take a clarity array with no tuning uh, for processing whatsoever, uh, and you apply it to a completely new environment that we've never seen before, such as a basketball game. So here is uh, an action. Um, here for basketball fans, there is a successful LAF action here. You can see how that looks like. You can see obviously motion of uh, people around. You can see the ball movement. And what we can do now is we can do the same thing by playing this as a pixel depth video. Once again, the same rules apply. 
everything is signal processing only. There is no machine learning. We wouldn't have time to train a model for a vascular arena anyway. Uh, everything is non-temporal, so per frame, and there is uh, no post processing of any kind. And just to uh, browse a bit more, let's take a look at, for example, this frame, detail view. So I'll go to detail view here, uh, and we'll look at the, what the pixel cloud here looks like. You can notice here, especially because of a very shiny floor, there are very strong reflections. Uh, bear with me, same thing happens. <clears throat> The danger of doing things live. Yeah, no way. Okay, here we go. Maybe this frame is good enough. Okay, let's go to detail view. And here we are. Okay, perfect. So, color image, as you can see here, very strong reflections uh, everywhere, some of them very clear or clean, uh, and some of them very diffuse, uh, which is important. So wherever there is a clear reflection, once again, we measure the reflected object distance, not the, not the floor. Wherever it's not clear, we just don't report anything because we, we cannot, we don't want to interpolate or guess. But what is, uh, what is really, really important here is seeing what the pixel cloud looks like. And as you can see here, every part of the scene is very nicely visible. Now, of course, this is, from, this is one frame from one array. So there will be a lot of occlusions and you can see a lot of these shadows. But of course, if we have multiple arrays placed around the arena, we could stitch all of those together and create a complete 3D world um, for, for this particular scene. And so you can see things, not only, uh, not only things such as um, the position of things uh, on objects and people, even if it's just a partial view of a person's torso and one, you know, one leg here, but you can see stuff like, and especially if you look frame to frame, what is the trajectory of the ball? Uh, what is the speed of, of movement of every uh, everybody? Um, what is the moment of, uh, you know, what is the inertia of things? So if there is, a, for example, uh, an attempt to flop or, or flop a foul, you will be able to measure whether there was actually any impact or not, right? whether it was a fake foul or a true foul. Uh, and all of this is visible from really with no, uh, no training whatsoever. This is all signal processing, just looking at what the camera pixels are telling us. Now we can go a bit further in this scene. Obviously the, the court is most interesting, but sometimes there are things happening here. We can see the coach, we can see every player on the bench, they are visible. So you can track what the, what the activity on the bench is. And then my favorite, uh, this, was, uh, this was captured during the pandemic uh, lockdown regulations. So there were uh, cardboard cutouts of players placed all over the arena to, uh, to enforce uh, social distancing. And so as you can see here, we have a couple of gentlemen who are real people. Uh, and you can see they have more 3D structure and they are next to three posters, which are flat. So they are not 3D. And then we have two people here, which are once again, real people. So you're able to identify uh, from 3D data, which you couldn't do from an image necessarily uh, directly, what are real people because they have a 3D structure to them, which is uh, volumetric versus what are only 2D, 2D cutouts because they don't. And this is at 50, 55 meters. So one of the famous question, can you, can you separate a person from a poster uh, from with the, using this data plus image data, it's doable. And that is, uh, that is all we have for today. If there are any further questions, happy to answer. Great. For our participants in the webinar, feel free to ask any additional questions as that is the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, Dave, you had mentioned earlier within the segment that you had non-automotive applications. Obviously, this was one Boris just sent out, but uh, are you guys looking at aerospace, agriculture, or any other industries uh, located here in the Southern California area or Northern California? Yeah. Yep, absolutely, Delbert. Great, great question. And, and we, we are uh, definitely in the precision agricultural space. We've got customers uh, professional sports, as you just saw from Boris, uh, and also robotics. Nice, nice. I don't know if we have any other questions. I think we covered them all yourself and Boris. Um, as you know, Dave, some of our membership is uh, university level. So if you guys are looking for any talent, uh, feel free to um, 
state your your contact info with regards to your website or any career pages you may have and then yeah, uh, yeah, our, our membership yeah, but, yeah by all means thank you delbert and i'd encourage people that are interested in this space to go to our website which is light.co light l-i-g-h-t dot c-o a look at our careers page uh, look at our intern section particularly if uh, college students are, are interested and uh, check out what the opportunities are Okay, great. I think that may bring us to a close. Uh, we're about uh, 70 minutes in. I don't see any additional questions. Um, so if that's the case, I just wanted to thank yourself, Dave, as well as Boris. Great content, great examples and demonstrations. And uh, if you guys want any closing comments, uh, feel free. It's now is the time. Yeah, well, just I would say again, uh, Delbert, thank you and SA for the chance to present. I think it's uh, you know, I think we're all here because it's a really exciting space and we all know we're solving probably one of the hardest problems tech has come up against in, in the history of tech, right? Uh, nothing is more difficult than full, complete, autonomous driving. And, and I think that um, what's great about it is working with people in the industry who recognize this and are here for the long haul to fix these things. We're excited to be part of it and we hope that, that our solution fills a few of the holes along the way of, of, of making this vision come true uh, for us in, 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 in the world over the next, uh, the next decade or so. Yeah, thank you everyone for the opportunity and it was a pleasure and looking forward to fur further advancements in the field. Okay, so with that's it. I think it's a wrap everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank again, like for their participation and all of those uh, webinar participants who joined us virtually. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thank you. Thank you. In closing, I'd just like to cover our upcoming events. Again, the month of April, we have quite a bit of activity. We have April 8th through the 10th, our SAE Aero Design Collective design competition in Van Nuys. Uh, on the 9th, we have a Stand 21 Safety Foundation Seminar at the Grand Prix in Long Beach uh, with specific discounted membership uh, for SAE members. On the 23rd, we have a student showcase at the SEMA Garage in Diamond Bar, which we will have student teams displaying their Formula One cars as well as Baja. And we'll also have a joint career fair. So any SAE members in, in universities, uh, we should have some companies there looking to hire engineering talent. And then last but not least, on May 9th through the 12th, uh, we have a, the Advanced Clean Transportation Expo in Long Beach in partnership with SAE, which is providing discounts for members as well. You can see our social media presidents, presidents on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. Those interested in membership, our website, www.sae.org. And then we have our membership chair, Gene Case. He can be located at membership at sesocal.org. Again, I'm Delbert Boone, Meeting and Tours Chair.